Now the next section, Section B, I will provide an introduction to some of the huge policy and healthcare changes underway and talk how health IT can be uh, used to support these policy changes and most importantly, how it can be integrated with the vision for population health and public health, both within classic public health community as well across the medical care system. So right now, as this is being recorded in, in 2014, there's probably never been a more dynamic time in health care, probably since the 1960s where the Medicare and Medicaid program in the U.S. were put in place. President Obama, with a lot of criticism, but not from those of us in public health, pushed through the Affordable Care Act, ACA, sometimes called a first derogatorily, now affectionately, Obamacare. And as the president says, he's been called worse things than caring. So uh, Obamacare is now okay. That has been huge, you know, the biggest change. But actually predating the ACA was as part of the stimulus package of 2009, the Obama administration put out the door something like 30 to $40 billion, depending how you count it, to build the health IT infrastructure in U.S. health care, primarily the medical care system, but also the public health system. This is often called the Meaningful Use Program. Sometimes the slang is MU because every doctor in America got something like $50,000. And if you're at a big health system like Johns Hopkins, multiply that by the number of doctors here. That's enough money that you notice over a several year period. It's the largest investment in digital technology for healthcare, to the best of my knowledge, any place in the world. And those of us in public health and in population health, I think it's incumbent on all of us to ensure that this is translated to really making a difference. You know, no disrespect to our medical colleagues, clinical colleagues, and uh, hospital colleagues, but simply because a, a patient has an EMR, that does not necessarily mean that the community will be healthier. So again, that's why the excitement of this area of population health and our new center at the Bloomberg School of Public Health that I lead, the Center for Population Health IT, or CFIT. It's also very exciting, in addition to being professor of health informatics, I'm a professor of health policy and management, and here at Johns Hopkins, I teach a course in population health informatics, a full course. I also teach a course in managed care. You might say managed care, often called health maintenance organizations or integrated delivery systems. You might say, some of you less familiar with that, is, you know, why is a public health professor interested in managed care? Because good managed care is also good population health and is good public health. What do I mean by that? As part of uh, President Obama's reform, Obamacare, there is a new acronym that has been uh, come out over the last few years, so-called Accountable Care Organizations, or ACOs. Not to be confused with the ACA, which is the slang for, for Obamacare or the uh, health insurance plan. ACOs have really been around for a long time previously called health maintenance organizations, HMOs. By the way, those of you that are students are welcome to take my class on the topic. Those of you that are not here in person, on our open courseware site, we make available material from my managed care class that really provides an introduction to the whole field of managed care and population health and ACOs, so I won't talk about that so much. But from the perspective of this lecture of population health informatics, one cannot integrate preventive care, primary care, outreach care without digital health care. Very exciting time here in Maryland. We have had, I know some of you are in Maryland now and some of you aren't, but all of you should pay attention to this. Starting as of January 2014, the federal government, that is the, the people that bring us Medicare and Medicaid, known as CMS, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also in, in, in uh, Baltimore, they approved uh, one of the biggest changes in health care uh, in the U.S. here in the state of Maryland. We have had, since the 1970s, a public utility commission that pays for hospitals in a fairly conventional way, that is fee-for-service per case. The more care given in the hospital, the more the hospital is paid, and it's turning it around uh, completely. First of all, there will be a global budget that is the all-payer, that is for both private and public payers, including Obamacare in this state, They've all bought into it. And not only will they work on a global budget so the hospital care cannot go above a certain threshold, they are now going to be paid for on population health basis. That is, they will be paid not just for how well they do for patients who are in the hospital for surgery or, or other types of intervention, 
but how well the patients, should I not even say patients, the consumers, the people are doing out in their community. This is profound. And you cannot do this without health information technology. So for all of you listening to this, you know, whether or not you're from a public health background, an IT background, a medical care background, now and forevermore, as the last uh, point I make on this slide, is sort of the integration of health IT, digital health, public health, clinical health will all be tied in together. So I alluded to the so-called High Tech Act. It started a few years ago, again, we're, we're in 2014. Depending on, on a, a various future policy, it is expected to continue for a few more years. It is the largest pay for performance often called P4P program in the world, to the best of my knowledge. I know the National Health Service, NHS, had a pretty big program in Europe called QOF, focusing on, on general practitioners. This, I believe, is even bigger. And what it means is that doctors, if they use the electronic medical record systems meaningfully, so it's not good enough just to put it on their desk, but they must first put the systems in place then that's often called a structure, you know, is the structural system in place? If you think about structure, process, and outcome, those of you who have followed quality of care. Then are they following, and that's meaningful use stage one. Uh, meaningful use stage two is focusing on how well they use the systems. And then meaningful use stage three, which is a, a year or two off, sitting here in 2014, is focusing not just on what they do, but the impact that it has. So the policymakers were very smart in not focusing just on putting a system in place, but how it can be used. As part of the high-tech program of 2009, it wasn't just putting a doctor EMR in place, but also setting up health information exchanges, HIEs, across the country. Here in Maryland, it's called CRISP, Chesapeake Regional Information System, CRISP. And every state, and then granted there's some issues about sustainability and funding. Here in Maryland, for example, every hospital in the state, in part as part of our all-payer waiver, which is that the uh, innovative thing I, I discussed uh, in the last slide, must participate in our health information exchange. Very exciting. So while it's true that in the past large systems such as Kaiser Permanente or the Veterans Affairs, VA, shared the EMR across their system, it is not true that in various cities in this country, and frankly other countries as well, all of the EMR information is shared. So if you're in public health or population health, you would have to actually knock on the door of dozens of doctors and hospitals to get the information. In the future, that will no longer be the situation. Moreover, any of you that ever tried to get data out of any information system, could be an EMR or a hospital system or, or even a public health system, the challenges have been one of comparability, standardization. Now, in order to get the $50,000 bonus for the performance, it has to be standardized. So you cannot just put in any old electronic medical record. The hospitals must be standardized. They need to talk with one another, and that's fairly profound. So those of you interested, particularly in U.S. payment and policy, I'd encourage you to learn more about meaningful use in high tech. But that's enough for now for this lecture. But it is a, really a profound change for those of us interested in healthcare and IT. What it means is hospitals, doctors in America now have systems in place and a few, uh, this is a controversial aspect, but a few of the meaningful use criteria that lead to payment mean they must communicate with public health. This next slide is really a conceptual model put together by the CDC. They've been long supporters of public health uh, informatics. And by the way, the term public health informatics is used somewhat differentially than population health informatics. Public health informatics would be the IT systems that support public health agencies. I use the term population health informatics to include all of that, plus the concept that population health and public health focus on entire communities. This graphic, put together by the CDC, uh, shows a very exciting image. Granted, uh, no one believes exactly that this will happen, but it's, it's good uh, for you, particularly those of you with a public health background, to see the concept. Perhaps if the U.S. had a uh, nationalized health program, which we don't, even though some people consider Obamacare nationalized, it is not at all. It's run by the private health care systems. But any system in the U.S. would take sort of collaboration across the various sectors you see here. The consumers in the foreground, 
the federal agencies uh, off to the left, the various information exchanges. By the way, the HIE information exchanges previously, and then some locations are also called RIOs, Regional Health Information Organizations, but these are entities, usually not-for-profit, sometimes for-profit, that merge across the community. Off to the right, I'm pleased to see public health agencies. Obviously, public health has nowhere near the resources as medical care. As uh, someone that does a lot of health economics, I can tell you public health agencies have about 3 to 4% of the U.S. health care dollar compared to about uh, 95% of the health care dollar goes to medical care. But nonetheless, speaking to a public health population health audience, they have obviously a key role, if not central, in our health care system. And, of course, individual providers, which really do have a dominant role, given that most providers are independent. That would include, you know, the majority in the U.S., providers who are independent or work for nonprofit organizations, often called integrated delivery systems. Now, uh, about 50 to 60 percent of all doctors are actually part of hospital systems, or it could include a public sector provider such as the VA. But this is an image, a vision, for how it all can be tied together. The Public Health Data Standard Consortium is a group that uh, helps pull together statistics and coordination in the public health community. And if you're interested in, in public health informatics, I'd encourage you to go to their webpage. This is one of their slides, and it was derived actually from a a previous survey. You'll see the source on the bottom. But it gives you a sense of all of the different uh, services offered by classic local health departments, uh, public health agencies. And this gives you a flavor of the types of areas that need digitalization. And you'll see some of them are actually uh, you know, more medical care focused. Others are classic public health. And sure enough, most public health agencies either have or in the process of digitizing these types of services in their community. Estimate done by the Public Health Data Standard Consortium on this slide shows the huge amount of fairly isolated information systems that are now scattered across U.S. public health agencies. So on average, again, this was a few years back, and you know I don't believe it's changed so much since when I did the survey, every local health department has something like uh, 23 different IT systems, you know, based on the slide I showed you before, the different services they offered. And every state health department has 19 different IT systems. So if you do the math, which they've done here, there are literally thousands of different types of systems, 70,000 they estimate, of these siloed systems that don't talk to one another. So just like their challenges in the medical care system, where there's far more resources pulling together the digitalized systems, I think it's essential in public health. This next slide, again, also from our colleagues at the Public Health Data Standard Consortium, provides an idea for a public health information exchange. Some of the forward-thinking states, Indianapolis comes to mind. The Indianapolis Health Information Exchange, which covers the state of Indiana, really is a model for how there is integration across public health agencies and the medical care system. And this is a model, somewhat public health-centric model, for how they can be integrated. Today, there's been great advances in a few locations, but by and large, it's the medical care infrastructure that is being focused on because that's where the money is. Uh, one of the charges to those of you who will be leaders in the public health community in the future is for you to take your little piece of the patch, whether or not it's a geographic area or a clinical area, and think about how the service of public health and or population health can be integrated into the broader base. The next slide, no talk on population health informatics would be complete without the previous discussion. And by the way, the two biggest applications of information technology in state and local health departments is actually immunization registries, although it was on the previous slide, I didn't mention that by name. A child can get their immunizations across an entire community in a public health clinic or in a pediatric clinic or in a hospital, and having a registry that keeps track of that, at least in today's time when electronic medical records aren't fully interoperable, that has often been a challenge that public health agencies have focused through registries. The second is the slide in front of you, syndromic surveillance. I think anyone in public health, anyone in epidemiology understands the importance of surveilling a condition uh, before it happens to do classic public health intervention. And this is an example by our colleagues at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory, 
Joe Lombardo, who is a, among the best known here at Johns Hopkins for his work in surveillance. Some very innovative analyses actually of insurance claims data and pharmacy data, being able to identify the flu before it happens. And this is a really exciting area for those of you interested in classic public health surveillance uh, of how the EMR can be used. Think about it. As soon as a lab test is completed, it is in the digital matrix. It's available. It's known. As soon as the doctor diagnoses a condition, it's known. As soon as a patient presents to the emergency room, emergency department with symptoms, it's known digitally. In fact, in Maryland, uh, I think it, uh, it takes five minutes for symptoms to enter our HIE and uh, five minutes after the doctor develops a diagnosis. So the opportunities for surveillance are huge, although the system's still in its uh, infancy. So I have talked about both the term uh, public health and population health, and I'm a, a 30-year professor of public health and committed to public health agencies. But as I've alluded to, I'm also a, a health care expert and knows where 97% of the health care dollar is. I believe that, yes, public health agencies are critically important, but for now and for the foreseeable future, uh, local public health departments are not going to run our health care system. Various other types of health care systems, whether or not it's an insurance company or a delivery system or a HMO, they have a denominator of patients that they're responsible for. But there is a controversy in the public health field that I wanted to acknowledge, and some actually uh, don't like to use the term population health. And this graphic depicts the fact that the larger oval is really an entire community, say the, the city of Baltimore or the state of Maryland, everybody in this state, regardless of who they are and what health insurance card they have. But we, in general, don't provide services at that level, though things like the, uh, the waiver and all payer are helping us think in that regard. And the fact that very soon everybody in the state will have a health insurance card through health reform makes it more exciting. But in the meantime, if you have a catchment area for your organization, as we do now here in the Johns Hopkins Health System, we're responsible not only uh, morally but also economically for the people that live in this area. That is really more the definition population health. So, so far in this section, I've talked about policy and I've talked about population health and public health. In the previous section, I've talked about the technology, the paradigms, electronic medical records, mobile health, et cetera. In this slide, I want to try to tie it all together to give you what I consider to be a, sort of a, an evolving framework that includes both population health and health care. So if we start off with the two ovals, if you think about the medical care interaction being the doctor, the clinician, the physician, and the patient, then if we uh, acknowledge that no uh, doctor or physician or nurse for that matter really practices alone, he or she is part of a team, a clinical team. And on the right-hand side, no person uh, is an island, hopefully. He or she is part of a family or a uh, network of, of friends. We must acknowledge that those are really key to understanding the dynamic. And for us, for this lecture, and my main point, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, no clinical team or doctor is really in isolation. They are part of an integrated community-based delivery system, such as an accountable care organization, which is sometimes a virtual network of providers. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Or part of some sort of a system that ties together the medical care process. And for those of us in public health on the right-hand side, uh, the other concentric circle is really the fact that families and patients are part of a population or community. So again, to review, if you think about the, quote, provider side on the left-hand side, it involves the clinician, the team, and the entire healthcare delivery system. If you think about the, quote, consumer side on the right-hand side, it really involves, you know, the individual, the consumer, the patient his or her family and or network that they're part of, and of course, the entire community. So this slide pauses and takes stock, many of the points I've already made, of really how everything I've introduced you to can have implications for population health. By the way, these are just suggestions. Many of you are smarter than I and will come up with others that aren't on this list. But just to review, one of the big differences between um, medical care and population health is, I say, uh, numerators and denominators. My colleagues at the Johns Hopkins Hospital do a great job, a fantastic job, caring for patients in the intensive care unit, ICU. That's their numerator. But very often the patients in the 
ICU shouldn't have gotten into the ICU. They got uh, more sick than they should have been, or they should have gotten care in other settings. So there's a case where thinking about the denominator and the numerator may vary. Thinking about who is getting care for late-stage uh, chronic disease, diabetes, uh, hypertension, is very different than thinking about the denominator of people at risk. You cannot integrate those various conceptual approaches without the digital frameworks that I've shared with you before. Secondly, I think that various tools and approaches to think just that I've already uh, suggested that, the population value perspective, meaning by doing outreach and preventive care, you can improve not only the bottom line of the healthcare system, but also the overall well-being. I think most of us would agree that we or our families uh, would prefer to get care uh, that's preventive or in a home or ambulatory basis rather than ending up in the ICU. I think the whole uh, issue of how we extract data, analyze data, some of it structured, some of it unstructured, often the overused term of big data. Big data is usually meant, uh, you know, uh, whether or not it's uh, uh, Amazon, Google, but taking information, disparate information, and pulling it all together up until now, mainly to sell something or consume resources. But how do we pull it all together? We've been working with big data for years with claims and EMR and vital records. But how do we take some of these newer techniques for analyzing and applying that to public health, born big data in a moment? And I think increasingly it's very difficult to analyze data to do population health and pull it together without frameworks and standards. So these are some of the challenges that I believe, you know, in over 30 years of the career, we have made more progress in these and other related uh, analytic population health uh, activities in the last two or three years than we have the previous years before that. And I predict in your careers, it will be exponential in terms of the increase. I think the whole uh, issue of how we extract data, analyze data, some of it structured, some of it unstructured, often the overused term of big data. Big data is usually meant, uh, you know, uh, whether or not it's uh, uh, Amazon, Google, but taking information, disparate information, and pulling it all together up until now, mainly to sell something or consume resources. But how do we pull it all together? We've been working with big data for years with claims and EMR and vital records. But how do we take some of these newer techniques for analyzing and applying that to public health, born big data in a moment? And I think increasingly it's very difficult to analyze data to do population health and pull it together without frameworks and standards. So these are some of the challenges that I believe, you know, in over 30 years of the career, we have made more progress in these and other related uh, analytic population health uh, activities in the last two or three years than we have the previous years before that. And I predict in your careers, it will be exponential in terms of the increase. This next slide is sort of cute. I thought I'd share it. You've all heard about big data. It's unclear what big data is. I've been studying it for, for years. But this slide actually by a company called Nuance, which is a uh, natural language processing, NLP, is sort of text mining. How do we take this information and pull it together? But you suck in the data on the left, try to figure out what it's saying, and then you use it for good. So in a final analysis, this isn't a technical slide, uh, but in a final analysis, that's what it's about. How do we pull in the data? How do we analyze the data? And how do we figure out how to use it? I got news to you. None of those tasks are easy. We've been doing that in um, you know, public health and healthcare analysis for years. I don't think I've mentioned this yet. I have a team here that, and colleagues on the faculty and, and many colleagues now that work on something called the Johns Hopkins ACG system. It's a predictive modeling big data system that's actually now in use with 100 million patients in 18 countries, 17 countries. You can learn more about that at, by just looking up Johns Hopkins ACGs or looking at my faculty page. But we have been uh, analyzing big data over the years, but that was using administrative data. Increasingly, we're using electronic medical record data. And so the opportunities that each of you face and whatever it is you care about in public health or health care to use these applications will be huge. One application that colleagues here at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, as part of uh, various innovations, a very intriguing, uh, fairly straightforward application of big data made famous in Camden, New Jersey, the so-called hot spotting. If you haven't read the so-called hot spotting article by Atul Gawande, you'll find that if you Google it. But he reports on the challenges of inner city communities and overusing hospital care, hence the hot spot 
rather than using public health and population services. So this is a hot spot heat map. You see the red in the uh, challenged communities of East Baltimore and West Baltimore, one of which where Johns Hopkins is based, of where people are using hospitalization. So this is an example of how public health, big data, and uh, medical care can all come together to benefit the community and society. So again, a very exciting domain and a good thing to end section B on. In the next section, I will continue some of the population applications and also move more toward the consumer's piece in population health.